talked about the space race, the first decade and a half of human spaceflight. But there's another aspect to the space race, an aspect that uh, continues today, and that is the story of exploration of the solar system by means of robotic spacecraft. It's a huge story, and we won't be able to talk more than a small amount about, about what these robot explorers have discovered about our universe. But we'll be able to classify the different kinds of spacecraft missions and think about what the requirements for propulsion and other technical requirements uh, will be for different kinds of missions. And we'll talk about some spectacular examples along the way. Let's begin by talking about the robots in orbit around the Earth, the artificial Earth satellites. Since 1957, we've launched thousands of them. There are well over a thousand in operation today. And with the advent of a new generation of low altitude, high speed communication satellites, that number is likely to increase many fold in the next few years. There are two aspects about the satellite's orbit that, that are closely connected to its possible functions. So let's talk about what those are. The first important orbital characteristic is altitude. How high is the satellite above the surface of the Earth? If the orbital radius is not much larger than the radius of the Earth, we call this low Earth orbit, from the Kármán line at the edge of the atmosphere out to about a 2,000 kilometer altitude. These satellites orbit the Earth several times a day, but the larger the orbit, the longer the orbital period. A large enough orbit can be a geostationary orbit. That means that the satellite goes around once every 24 hours, and a satellite like that can stay above a fixed point on the Earth's equator as the Earth rotates. A very useful kind of orbit for a communication satellite. The next important orbital characteristic is the inclination of the orbit. That's the angle between the orbital plane and the equator of the Earth. A satellite with an inclination of zero degrees only passes over places on the equator. But a satellite with a higher inclination may fly over more of the Earth's surface as the Earth rotates. That might be very important for a satellite that is looking at the ground, taking pictures, for example, of the ground. If you make the inclination 90 degrees, a polar orbit, then the satellite actually passes over every point on the surface of the Earth. Which brings us to robot space exploration, where we send our robots beyond Earth orbit. Almost all of the exploration of the solar system beyond Earth orbit has been done by a robot spacecraft. Uh, and, and in the 1960s and 70s, this was a, very much a part of the space race between the United States and the Soviet Union. If you want to send a robot to another planet, you are facing a lot of challenges. For one thing, you're facing a challenge of propulsion. There's a very high delta V required for Earth escape, and different sorts of robot missions may require other ro rocket maneuvers later on in their, in their uh, mission. Also, there are problems of communication and navigation over immense distances, tens or hundreds of millions of kilometers, even billions of kilometers. These missions might last a long time, months or years or even decades, and so your spacecraft has to be able to function for that period of time in the harsh environment of space. And finally, the, um, the, the robot's going to require a certain degree of autonomy. The robot's going to have to be able to function on its own, take care of itself, do its job, send its data back to Earth. Now we're going to take some time to classify the different kinds of robotic space missions to other planets. Uh, and we'll start with the, the easiest kind, although they're all difficult, and go to the more elaborate, more complex, more challenging kinds of missions. And each different kind of mission will, will enable us to accomplish different things, and each will pose its own kinds of challenges on the spacecraft and 
the rocket that propels it. The first and by far the simplest kind of spacecraft mission is a flyby mission. The spacecraft simply follows a free trajectory that takes it past its target. Once you get going on the right trajectory soon after launch, you need very little additional rocket propulsion. Gravity is steering the spacecraft. Now this is the simplest type of mission design, and usually the first reconnaissance mission to another world is a flyby mission type. The disadvantage is that your observations of the, of the target planet are, are limited to a brief period of time near the point of closest approach. And so, so you have to cram in a lot of observation in a short period of time. One of the uh, most notable flyby missions was Mariner 2, which we have already mentioned, which was a flyby mission past the planet Venus. And another very famous one was the twin Pioneer 10 and 11 mission. Um, both spacecraft had flybys of the planet Jupiter in 1973 and 74, the first close-up look at that planet in human history. And Pioneer 11 was also able to make a flyby of Saturn in 1979. This tells us that if we're clever about designing our trajectory, we can use a single spacecraft to make flyby encounters with many planets. We can use the gravity of one target planet to shape the trajectory and adjust the speed of the spacecraft to send it to another target. For example, the Mariner 10 spacecraft in the early 1970s made a flyby of Venus and no fewer than three separate flybys of the planet Mercury, our first mission to that innermost planet of our solar system. And uh, a, a few years later, Voyager 2 um, flew by no fewer than four planets, the planet Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all in the space of about a dozen years. It didn't need any extra fuel to get to these planets. It just used the gravity of one planet to send it toward the next. Here's a beautiful animation of the trajectories of Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. It starts with Voyager 2 leaving the Earth. Voyager 1 is already launched. And the two spacecraft go flying to the outer solar system. They, they cross the orbit of Mars. And um, taking several years on, on the journey, they approach the planet Jupiter. Now we're getting close to Jupiter. First, Voyager 1 passes by the planet, and then, not too long afterwards, Voyager 2 passes by the planet, and both spacecraft continue on toward the planet Saturn. We're going to speed up the animation as we go to the outer solar system. There's Voyager 1 passing by Saturn and being deflected out of the plane of the solar system, but Voyager 2 is sent onward toward next planet, the planet Uranus. And at Uranus, its trajectory is bent again until it encounters Neptune, and then itself leaves the plane of the solar system and heads out into interstellar space. The next type of mission is a probe mission. It's a little bit more difficult than a flyby mission, but not too, too much. It, it requires slightly better navigation, and you have a little bit less time to perform your observations. In a probe mission, you just slam the spacecraft into the planet, either as an impact probe, like the uh, American Ranger probes um, impacting the moon in the 1960s, or drop it into an atmosphere, like the Soviet Venera 4 probe that dropped into the atmosphere of Venus in 1964. Um, uh, let's take a look at some NASA video from a couple of the Ranger missions. The mission of the Block 3 Ranger flights 
was to obtain television pictures of the small-scale topography in selected areas of the lunar surface, which would benefit science and the manned lunar program. On July 31, 1964, 1,120 kilometers, NASA's Ranger 7 spacecraft, 576 kilometers, impacted the moon in a pre-selected target area. Camera B provided valuable oblique views. Nine minutes to impact. Altitude, 608 kilometers. Impact. During the last 17 minutes of flight, the spacecraft transmitted back to Earth more than 4,000 pictures of the lunar surface. Unlike Rangers 7 and 8, which impacted Maria, Ranger 9 was directed at a highland crater of more specific scientific interest, the crater Alphonsus. The Ranger 9 spacecraft impacted on the moon 24 March 1965. Total spacecraft travel time on its picture-taking journey to the moon, 64 hours, 31 minutes, 12 seconds. The P Channel's cameras provided overlapping coverage among themselves, and all four P cameras photographed areas included within the coverage of the A and B cameras. Each of the four cameras sent a total of 1,340 high-quality pictures to the receiving station at Goldstone, California. Distance traveled, 414,629 kilometers. The spacecraft at impact was traveling at a velocity of just under 9,600 kilometers per hour. The next most complicated mission type is the orbiter mission. In an orbiter mission, the spacecraft approaches its target planet and then fires its rocket motor, its own rocket motor, to slow down and enter a closed orbit about the planet. Now that's a, a much more complex um, business. It requires a significant rocket maneuver at just the right time. Uh, the good news is that an orbiter mission can acquire information about its target for months or for years and, and greatly increase the scientific um, uh, payoff of, of, the, of, the, of the mission. Um, the problem is that slowing down requires a, a significant rocket motor or, or possibly the use of aerobraking where you use the atmosphere of the planet itself to slow down. And the delta V requirements for this might be one kilometer per second, or, or even more. A nice example of, a, uh, of an orbiter mission is the lunar orbiter mission of the mid-1960s. There were several of these, of these orbiting spacecraft in orbit around the moon, and over a period of a couple of years, they sent back thousands upon thousands of high-resolution images of the lunar surface from close range. Over 99% of the lunar surface was photographed by Lunar Orbiter. There's a gigantic difference between what a flyby probe can tell you and what an orbiter can tell you about a planet. In the uh, mid-1960s, the Mariner 4 probe became the, the first successful uh, spacecraft to fly past the planet Mars. Mars, of course, has been a, uh, uh, had been a, uh, a planet of the imagination for for centuries. And what Mariner 4 found was that Mars was a lot less interesting than people thought it might be. The pictures and data recorded by Mariner 4 revealed Mars to be a cold, barren planet. The atmosphere contains little or no oxygen and appears to be composed largely of carbon dioxide. There were no obvious traces of the canals as indicated on maps of Mars, no evidence of life forms. But the pictures cover only 1% of the Martian surface. General surface features are similar to the moon, with many craters, but with no great valleys, continental masses, mountain chains, or ocean basins. So basically, Mars is a deserted, heavily cratered world, like like the moon with a thin atmosphere. That's what they thought. <laughs>
But then in 1971, the orbiter, Mariner 9, spent a year photographing the surface and finding very different kinds of features. Mariner 9 found evidence that vast amounts of liquid water had flowed across the surface in the different distant past. It saw evidence of tremendous catastrophes and, and volcanic features, features of, of tectonism, and, and to top it all off, the largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons, 26 kilometers high and bigger across than the state of Ohio. A single spacecraft might execute several different missions, indeed several missions of different types. And one of the most spectacular examples of that in the history of spaceflight is the United States spacecraft Galileo, which was launched from the space shuttle in 1989. In order to conserve fuel, Galileo didn't go directly to Jupiter. Instead, it flew by planets in the inner solar system several times in order to pick up a little energy gravitationally. So the first planet it encountered was the planet Venus in 1990, and then it flew past the Earth in, later in the same year. In 1991, it had an encounter with the asteroid 951 Gaspra, giving us one of our earliest looks at uh, one of these minor bodies of the solar system. Then in 1992, it flew past the Earth again, getting its final kick to head out to Jupiter. But along the way to Jupiter, it flew past an even larger asteroid, the asteroid 243 Ida. And so here's a picture of that, along with its, its moon, a moon of an asteroid, the tiny dactyl, only a kilometer across. In 1994, still tens of millions of kilometers away from Jupiter, it, it made distant observations of a remarkable event, the impact of the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 on Jupiter. And Galileo was in a slightly different um, uh, place than the Earth, and so it could make observations that would not have been possible with Earth-based telescopes. Finally, in 1995, it got to its primary target, Jupiter. On the 7th of December, 1995, two important events took place. The first was that the main spacecraft fired its rocket motors and entered orbit around the planet Jupiter. It became the first Jupiter orbiter. Second, a probe that had been released sometime before by the, by the spacecraft entered the atmosphere of Jupiter, plunged into that, that uh, vast ocean of, of hydrogen and helium and methane gas, and uh, deployed a parachute and slowly sank down into those turbulent clouds, giving us our first close-up data about the atmosphere of Jupiter. This was our, uh, our first probe to touch the largest planet in our solar system. For the next eight years, the Galileo orbiter would circle Jupiter and explore the planet and its moons. Each of the four largest moons of Jupiter is practically a planet in its own right. They're very different and very strange, and Galileo gave us our best view yet of them. Finally, in September of 2003, the Galileo spacecraft was directed to alter its orbit and to enter the atmosphere of Jupiter and burn up. The mission is over. So, was the Galileo mission a flyby mission, a probe mission, or an orbiter mission? And the answer, of course, is it was all of the above, at different times, for different targets. Even more difficult than an orbiting mission is a landing mission, a lander on the surface of another world. The idea is to, is to take a machine, a robot, and put it softly enough on the ground that it can still function. And this is far more difficult and far more complex, but it has a very big payoff. It allows us to get, through our robots, direct observations of surface conditions, composition, and so on. Now, 
The trick is you have to slow down before you reach the surface by some combination of rocket motors and perhaps parachutes if your planet has an atmosphere. Um, you have to, to achieve landing speeds of only a few meters per second. Zero altitude at zero speed to a very high precision. That's not easy. Here's my favorite picture of a lander. In fact, it's a picture of two landers. In the foreground is Surveyor 3, a robot probe which landed on the moon in 1967. And in the distant background is Apollo 12, a, 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 a manned lander, a, a human carrying spacecraft that landed in the same place, just a couple of hundred meters away, two years later. And so the astronauts um, uh, strolled across the, uh, the, the, the plains of, of Mare Imbrium and examined their robot predecessor. Here are a couple of famous landing missions. First we have the Viking 1 and 2 twin spacecraft, the first successful landers on the planet Mars. There were also Viking orbiters that went along with the, uh, with the landing craft. Um, and then on the right is Venera 13, which was a successful lander on the surface of Venus. In fact, only the Soviet Union ever made successful landings on Venus. The conditions there were so intense that the landers only lasted um, a, a few dozen minutes. Each of these landing spacecraft gave us an idea of what the surface of the planet was like. So at the top we see one of the first pictures of Mars sent back by Viking 1. And on the bottom, we see a picture of the surface of Venus from Venera 13. There are variations of the basic lander that are even more technologically challenging. The first is a rover. The a challenge is to, to land a, 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 a moving vehicle on the surface of another world and use it to explore uh, the surroundings. And, and this has a big payoff because you can explore a larger area. And then finally, the most challenging of all is the sample return mission. At the right here is the Luna 16 sample return mission. It is how the Soviet Union, despite not being able to send human beings to the moon, were able to recover almost a kilogram of lunar material for their own study. To give you some idea of the technical challenge of putting a big, complex rover on the surface of another planet, I've, um, um, I'm going to show you a, a, a sequence of actual images taken by the Curiosity Mars Science Laboratory rover during its final descent sequence. So at the beginning, you'll see it eject its heat shield and begin to descend toward the surface at the end of a, a high-speed parachute. Um, the, um, the parachute has to function at supersonic speeds because of um, uh, because of how fast the lander is entering the atmosphere. So it takes a while to reach the ground. When you get close to the ground, the, the parachute itself is ejected. The parachute's not good enough. And the, the lander is lowered at the end of a cable from, uh, from its parent spacecraft, where the rocket motors are. The rocket motors um, kick up some dust and... Uh, and um, lower the, the rover gently to the surface, and then cut the cable and, and, um, and shoot away to uh, um, another location hundreds of meters away. That's how Curiosity reached the planet Mars. But if you can do that, then you get to do this. When the Curiosity rover climbed a ridge and the skies cleared up during Martian winter, we had the chance to take this amazing panorama. And I'm really glad we did. Curiosity is inside Gale Crater, a huge basin made by an impactor about 3.8 billion years ago. The mountains across the crater floor are actually the northern rim of the crater. They rise over a mile above the rover.
It's so clear when we took this image that you can even see a hill outside the crater that is 50 miles away. I love how you can see Peace Vallis, a channel that once held a flowing river, like many others that formed lakes inside Gale Crater. This is also the first time we could look back and see everywhere we've been so far in the mission since landing in 2012. Here's the path we took. After landing, we drove to Yellowknife Bay. Before we turned southwest through Darwin, Cooperstown, and the Kimberley. The rover studied dark, wind-blown sand at Namib Dune. Curiosity then weaved between the Murray Buttes, checked out Irison Hill, and made a tricky crossing of the Bagnell Dunes before reaching the ridge where it sits today and caught this amazing view. Sending a mission to another world, be it a, a simple flyby mission or a complex lander with a rover, is one of the most challenging scientific and engineering tasks that human beings undertake. And when you are considering, planning, and designing, you need to make a lot of, a lot of choices um, depending on what you want to accomplish in your mission. Let's think about some of those choices and some of the compromises that we have to make in order to design our spacecraft. The first is a compromise of mass and cost. A more massive spacecraft may have more capabilities, but that also makes it much more expensive, much more expensive to build and far more expensive to launch to the target planet. So the high cost of spaceflight means that we'll try to design our spacecraft to be as low mass as possible. Also, a complex mission is, is harder to do, and it costs more, and it has a lot more potential for failure. There are a lot more things that can go wrong. On the other hand, a complex mission can have a bigger scientific payoff. Finally, we have to think about reliability and redundancy. Our spacecraft must be able to function for years in outer space, and we can't do routine maintenance on it. If it breaks down, we have to be able to fix it by radio. The spacecraft must be able to deal with some malfunctions and some changes in the mission plan and still carry the thing off successfully. One thing we're going to have to think about is our launch system, the rocket that takes our spacecraft from Earth and sends it on its way to the target planet. It had better be a pretty powerful rocket because the escape velocity from the Earth is 11.2 kilometers per second. So it's a much more challenging problem than simply putting something into orbit. The picture here is a picture of the Cassini-Huygens um, launch um, uh, to, to the planet Saturn. Uh, Cassini was a US probe. Huygens was a European Space Agency probe. And they were sort of, they were sort of a combined mission. And, uh, and this was launched on a Titan 4B Centaur, one of the largest rockets operating today. Our spacecraft is also going to need an onboard propulsion system. It's going to need that to make small mid-course corrections, and also, if it's going to make any orbital insertions or landing maneuvers, it has to have a very powerful rocket system for that. You're probably going to need a liquid fuel engine. Uh, there are some alternatives. Um, the Dawn spacecraft, for example, used an ion engine. Uh, but uh, if you have liquid fuels, you have to have tanks for them, and you have to uh, choose fuels that are storable for a long time so that the uh, system's ready to use when you get to your destination. Our robot spacecraft is also going to have what we might call infrastructure. It's going to need a basic framework on which we can attach all the other parts of it. This is called the bus. And so that, that picture on the, um, on the left is the bus of the Stardust spacecraft, which was uh, uh, intended to sample uh, a, a comet. And we also need a kind of command and data system. We need an onboard computer, or presumably more than one computer, to be, uh, to be in charge and to direct the experiments and to record data. And they need to be very flexible computers and very fault tolerant. They need to be very resistant to uh, radiation environments and so on. So um, uh, here we have the um, spacecraft uh, uh, control data system electronic assembly for the, uh, 
for an example. We're also going to need a source of electrical power. Now, the very earliest satellites just had batteries, and when the batteries had run out, the, the system died. But nowadays, there are basically two choices. We can either have solar cells, or we can use radiothermal generators. Now, solar cells are efficient, they are reliable. You need a battery system to store the power, but, uh, but you can recharge the batteries with the solar cells. And, and depending on your power requirements, you might need very large solar cells. But if you are trying to do something that requires a lot of power, or if you are sending your spacecraft to the far reaches of the solar system where there isn't much sunlight, you're going to need radiothermal generators. Um, these radiothermal generators use radioisotopes to generate heat, and from the heat we, um, um, uh, we generate electricity. Uh, and um, if we use these, we're going to have to shield the rest of the spacecraft from the heat and radiation produced by the RTG unit. Um, the RTG units can last for decades, and so that's a good thing, um, but they are, uh, they are an investment, and, uh, and they are very expensive because plutonium-238 is, is not cheap and easy to get. We're also going to need to have a communication system. The spacecraft must be able to transmit and receive signals with the Earth over immense distances, tens or hundreds of millions of kilometers, maybe billions of kilometers. And the spacecraft doesn't have all the power in the world. Maybe it has a, a, an available signal power of, of maybe 20 watts. So one thing the spacecraft's going to need is a high-gain antenna. That is to say, a highly directional dish antenna system that permits sending and receiving very narrow beam radio signals. And it probably will also have a low-gain antenna, which is a much less directional antenna system, um, but it can only operate at a much lower data rate. That way, uh, if uh, the high-gain system fails, you'll still be able to communicate with the spacecraft. Of course, the, um, the, the ground side of this equation is the, um, is the uh, communication system on Earth. The United States uses something called the Deep Space Network, which is a network of three very large radio antennas that uh, can communicate um, with, uh, with spacecraft even out beyond um, Pluto. We'll also need to consider what scientific instrumentation needs to be carried by our spacecraft. We can have space environment sensors that measure magnetic fields, ion concentrations, dust particles, and so on. We can also have remote sensing instruments, including cameras and other imagers, and um, uh, radar systems, and so on. And they're often um, the most informative of the sensors. And if we have a landing spacecraft, we can also have what we might call contact sensors, sensors that require you to come into physical contact with what you're studying, seismometers, thermometers, uh, equipment for measuring the chemical composition of soil, and so on. So these are, are the, the main types. There are other types, like um, uh, you can use the communication system, for example, to, to track the spacecraft very precisely and measure a planet's mass. Um, but... Uh, 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 but once you've made the decisions about all these different kinds of instruments, you're ready to launch your spacecraft. Let's look at some notable examples. Our first example is the 1966 Soviet um, uh, spacecraft, Luna 9, which was the first spacecraft to make a soft landing on the lunar surface. Now, it had neither solar cells nor radiothermal generator. It just had batteries, and so it only operated for about eight hours on the surface. But during that time, it gave us our first look at what the lunar surface was like. Here's the Mariner 9 spacecraft that we mentioned earlier, the first successful Mars orbiter. It's powered by solar cells, which we can see in a, in a sort of a, 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 an X pattern. Um, we can see the high-gain antenna for communicating with Earth. At the bottom, we see the instrument platform, where the cameras and so forth are. And at the very top, we see the expansion nozzle for the rocket motor that put Mariner 9 into orbit around the planet. Here's one of the two identical Voyager spacecraft that made flybys of Jupiter and the other outer planets. Let's go around clockwise, starting at the left, to see the various elements of the spacecraft. We see the radiothermal generators sticking out to the, to the left, um, and then at the top we see the dish-shaped high-gain antenna for communicating to Earth from 
hundreds of millions or billions of kilometers away. On the right, we see the instrument platform that can aim the cameras and other sensors in various directions. That sort of boxy middle part is the spacecraft bus, and at the bottom of that is the main engine that allowed it to make mid-course corrections. Here's something that's not shown in this picture, and that's a long pole with a little instrument on the end of it, the magnetometer, which they put at the end of a pole so that the metal body of the spacecraft won't affect the readings. Here's something a bit more recent, the New Horizons spacecraft, which was launched in 2006 and flew past Pluto and its moon Charon in July of 2015, and then later by a, a small, very distant body called Ultima Thule in January 2019. And once again, we can look at the various parts of the spacecraft. We see um, the high-gain antenna, which uh, needs to communicate over billions of kilometers. We can see the radiothermal generators. And then we can see various instruments, like the imaging systems and the solar wind experiment. Here's the Dawn spacecraft, which you may recall from a homework problem a little bit earlier in the semester. Um, Dawn was launched in 2007. And its propulsion, uh, the, the propulsion of the spacecraft, is an ion rocket engine um, with a specific impulse of over 3,000 seconds. It needs that because it's the only spacecraft ever to orbit two different planetary bodies. It went into orbit around the minor planet Vesta, then left Vesta and went to the other minor planet, Ceres, um, two of the largest bodies in the asteroid belt, and, and studied them for several years. Its mission was, uh, was, was ended quite recently. And since we're talking about exploring minor bodies in the solar system, I should mention a couple of remarkable asteroid explorers. One of them is the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft launched by Japan, which has, which has thoroughly surveyed the, um, the asteroid Ryugu. And then there's another one from the United States, OSIRIS-REx, which is at the moment orbiting asteroid Bennu and will very soon, in the next few days as I record this, um, uh, grab a sample of the surface and begin to bring it back to Earth for study. Okay, so that's about the end. Um, we've seen different types of spacecraft missions to explore other worlds, flyby missions, probes, orbiter missions, landers, landers with rovers or sample return, each one more complicated, more challenging than the last, but perhaps more rewarding in what we learn about the universe. In some measure, this lecture sets the table for a later part of the course, because we've seen that some of these missions require some fairly sophisticated orbital maneuvers, zooming by a planet to change direction and gain some energy, or um, uh, firing a rocket motor in, to enter into orbit around a distant world. What's required? How does that work? How much fuel are we going to need? We'll be able to answer those questions a little later in the semester. So, we'll see you then. <laughs>